Hey everybody, welcome to Luca Talk Sports, part of the Sports Talk Line Network where we talk sports 24-7, 365. I'm your host, Luca DeAngelis. Today's show, I don't actually have a guest, I'll be riding solo, uh, so it'll probably be a bit of a shorter show. And on today's show, I'll be discussing the Nets and Bucks epic Game 7 that just finished. I'll be previewing the Suns and the Clippers series, and I'll also be previewing the Hawks and Sixers Game 7 tomorrow. So at the time of recording, those haven't happened yet. Um, when this goes up, both both Game 1 of the Suns-Clippers series and Game 7 of Hawks and Sixers might have happened. So just keep that in mind when watching this video. Without further ado, let's get into the show. So first up, I'd like to talk about Bucks and Nets. So that just finished probably an hour or two ago. The Milwaukee Bucks ended up winning 115 to 111 in an overtime game. I think it was the first overtime game seven since I think it was Dallas and San Antonio. I want to say back in 2006. It was a long, long time ago. So overtime game sevens don't exactly happen every day. Um, it went to overtime in the first place because Kevin Durant hit one of the most ridiculous shots I've ever seen. Um, it was like a spinning fadeaway, like turnaround jump shot, which I originally thought was a three-pointer, but it turns out his toe was just on the line. Replays confirmed that that was the case. Turns out that the Nets were a toe away from making it through to the Eastern Conference Finals. Um, and unfortunate that they just didn't have the juice in overtime. Um, for the game, Durant ended up playing all 53 minutes, so it's the second game in a row. He didn't sit. He went for 48 points on 17 of 36 from the field, nine rebounds, six assists. Um, however, the last shot that he took was a bit ill-advised. Um, the, the Nets were down by two. He had Drew Holiday one-on-one. -on -one. He could have probably tried to blow by and pull up for you know his patented mid-range pull-up jump shot to send the game to double overtime. He went for game with that same turnaround, fading three. He didn't have the legs. It was an air ball in the end. Can't fault him for today's performance, but that was a bit of a questionable shot. Um, from Milwaukee's side of things, Giannis actually answered a lot of his critics in emphatic fashion. He went for 40, 13, and 5. I think he was the first player to do that in a game 7, in a winning game 7. I believe Tim Duncan and Jerry West both did it in losing game 7s. Um, 15 of 24 from the field. 8 of 14 from the line. Um, he actually started off, I think it was... I think he started like two of seven from the line and ended up missing one or two, like one free throw the rest of the way. Um, this is with the Nets crowd counting out, like counting down while we're shooting free throws. Um, they're counting pretty quick as well. It would have put me off if I was in his position. So good on him for, you know, rebounding from a tough free throw shooting start. He was phenomenal at taking it to the rim. He, he was he was a difference in the game ultimately. Um, Brooke Lopez played, played outstanding. He had one of the best playoff blocks I've ever seen um, as a help defender, um, stopping Durant from what was almost certainly a, an easy two points. Um, 19 points, 19 points, sorry, eight rebounds, four blocks, seven of 11 from the field. Uh, Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday both had pretty atrocious shooting games. Nine of 26 for Middleton, five of 23 for Holiday, but both hit big shots in the fourth and in overtime. So... Despite them having poor games by their standards, they stepped it up when it mattered. From the Nets side, James Harden's clearly hurt. Um, he went 5 from 17 from the field, 2 of 12 from 3. He still had 9 boards and 9 assists. He can still affect the game positively, but he just he didn't have that explosion that you normally see. Like Harden had Giannis ISO on him a few times. He had Brook Lopez on him. And he didn't do his usual blow-by, take it to the rim, or even his step back. He just looked to pass. So you could tell that, I, I don't know if in the post-game Brooklyn revealed the extent of his injury, just based on what I've seen and based on my own experiences with the injury, I think he was playing with a, a torn hamstring, maybe not severely torn um, because he could still move like without limping, but I think he was playing with a torn hamstring. He also played the full 53 minutes. So yeah, um, great effort for him to, to even play the last few games in the first place, but he clearly wasn't himself, and the Nets just didn't have enough without Kyrie Irving. Um, Blake Griffin and Bruce Brown played well. Um, Blake Griffin went for 17, 11, and 3. Brown, 14, 6, and 2. But um, at the end of the day, shooting was the difference between the two teams today. Um, 
Brooklyn went 12 of 39 from three, which is just under 31%. But Milwaukee went 15 of 36, which is just under 42%. So that was a big difference between the two teams. And Milwaukee, like, I know it's oversimplifying the matchup, but Milwaukee were healthy and Brooklyn weren't. And I think that was a difference in the series. Um, in terms of Game 7 in particular, the difference was that Giannis was taking less dumb shots. He still had a couple of fadeaways. He still shot six threes, which is probably a bit too many for Giannis. But instead of forcing up shots, he was a lot more willing as a passer than he's been in previous games this series. Um, he had five assists and a lot of hockey assists where he'd drive and kick it out and get get some initiate some good ball movement from from Milwaukee's end. So to see Giannis adjust, especially after the criticism, um, the well-founded criticism he had earlier in the series, yeah, it was impressive. And so now Milwaukee wait. They face the winner of Atlanta and Philadelphia. So that game happens tomorrow. I'm not sure what time it is in Eastern time. In Australia, where I live, it's at 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So, yeah, it's the second game that's happening tomorrow. So let's, yeah, that's as good a point as any to transition to that series. So it's it's three all between Philly and Atlanta. Philly were down big in Game 6, but they stormed back to win 104 to 99. Um, <clears throat> sorry, let me just get some water. When I'm talking solo and I don't have a guest to, to kind of bounce off, water, water, <laughs> I, I end up talking a lot more than I normally would, so I'm probably going to need to stop for water a lot more than I normally would. Um, okay, where was I? Yeah, so... <clears throat> yeah, Philadelphia in their in their big second second half comeback. They were led by Seth Curry. He was twenty four points, six of nine from three. He was he was unbelievable. He he was the best player for the Sixers, and he was a big reason why they took a, took the lead in the third quarter. Tobias Harris had an excellent game. He ended up getting stronger as the game went on. Twenty four points, five boards, nine of twenty from the field. Joel Embiid. Bit of a rough game. Um, I know 22 and 13 looks good in the box score with a couple of blocks, but 9 of 24 from the field, 8 turnovers, 4 personal fouls. There's, I've noticed that Embiid, Embiid, it could be partly because of his torn meniscus in his knee, but <clears throat> Embiid's conditioning is not great at the moment. Last game where the Hawks steamrolled the Sixers in the second half, Embiid was 0 of 12 in that half, and he just seems to fade as games go on. So I don't know how much of that can be attributed to injury and how much of that can be attributed to conditioning, but it is a problem for the Sixers. And speaking of problems for the Sixers, Ben Simmons is a ghost. Um, he, he was he was six nine and five in twenty five minutes of court time. Reduced court time was because of foul trouble. He had five personal fouls. He got three early ones very quickly. He was two of four from the line for the series. Let me just pull this number up really quickly. Ben Simmons for the series has shot. 14 of 43 free throws for 32.6%. So he's normally a bad free throw shooter, but he's there's some mental stuff going on there. It's it's bad. And you know what? His foul trouble was actually a blessing in disguise for Philly because it forced Doc Rivers to play Tyrese Maxey 29 minutes. And Maxey's actually what kept them, the game from blowing out in the second quarter. He had a huge second quarter, 16 and 7, 5 of 12 from the field, 5 of 8 from the line. Um, he was a plus 12, which is the best mark on the Sixers team. Meanwhile, Simmons was a minus 7, which is the worst mark on the team. I think Doc Rivers isn't a very good coach, and I think he got bailed out by foul. The Ben Simmons foul trouble forced him to make an adjustment he would have, wouldn't have otherwise made, and I think that adjustment actually ended up saving the series for the, um, for the Philadelphia 76ers. So going to the Atlanta side of things, Trey Young started off ridiculously hot. I think he scored 17 first quarter points or something. Cooled off a bit later on. He was 34, 5, and 12 um, on 13 of 30 from the field, 43.3%. 5 of 10 from 3, 3 of 5 from the line. Those numbers are ridiculous. He bet he did cool down a little bit. They, they stopped. It looked like Ben Simmons was guarding him a lot early, and Young was cooking Simmons, uh, especially in the pick and roll. Simmons just... Even defensively, for the guy who's meant to be number like a defensive player of the year candidate and who finished second, he, he looked lost. And yeah, when they when they played Thibel on Young a lot more and, and trapped and doubled more, that was that's how the that's how they came back defensively, getting the ball out of Trey's hands. 
His role plays really let him down, though. I mean, Kevin Huerta was the only one that showed up. He went for 17, 11, and 4 on 7 to 15 from the field. But when you have... Oh, I guess Clint Capella played all right with 14 and 11, too. But you get 7 points from John Collins. You get 7 points from Bogdan Bogdanovich. 0 points from Lou Williams, when Lou Williams was a big reason why they came back in Game 6. Um, sorry, Game 5, previous game. Uh, actually, Gallinari played well as well with 16 points off the bench, but uh, it's mainly Collins and Bogdanovich. I mean, they're the n- number two and number three scorers on the team. When they combine for 14 points, it's 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 going to be really tough to win the game from there. So Bogdanovich um, is a- also hurt himself late in the fourth quarter. It looked like it was knee soreness. There is no status update at present whether he'll be available for game seven. If he's not available, I think Philadelphia are going to close this out at home. Like, Philly are just... They're, I know when I previewed the series when Joshua Griffith was on my show for the last episode, I mentioned that Philly would have a you know a good chance of losing if Embiid didn't suit up. Well, he suited up, and even though he's faded in the second half of games, he's still, you know, he's still 30, 30 and 13 for the series on 46% from the field. He's still been plenty effective. So I still think that with him there, Philly, top to bottom, have the better roster. They're also playing at home, so they should win it. But Atlanta have won two games on the road already this series. So I'm, I mean, it's no secret that I'm rooting for the Hawks. I love Trey Young. He's, he, he played for my favorite college, so I've always had a soft spot for him even as a pro. And the Hawks are the underdog story, so I think anyone who doesn't have a team left in the playoffs was probably rooting for the Hawks, so... From that standpoint, I want them to win, and I believe they can win because they've they've done it twice in Philly already this series. But they're just they're just not as good a team, and I think without Bogey especially, they just don't have the top to bottom firepower that Philly have. Like Seth Seth Curry has been playing like he's been playing out of his skin this series. Twenty two points per game, fifty sorry sixty percent from three. Like that's not on small volume either. That's twenty eight from forty seven from three. So they just don't have an answer for him. So I, th- I think Philly take it in seven. I hope I'm wrong. It's going to be an absolute cracker of a game. Definitely recommend you watch it if you don't have anything else to do when the game is on. All right. Next up, I'd like to discuss the Western Conference Finals. We've got the Utah Jazz got eliminated. But sorry. Yeah, Utah got eliminated by the Clippers yesterday. So four games to two was how it finished. Suns have been resting for a while, so we have a Clippers versus Suns final. I, I can't say I expected that, especially because... Oh, I mean, sorry, let me rephrase. I thought it was a 50-50 series going in. I gave the edge to the Jazz, but then, then Mitchell got hurt and Conley didn't come back till late. So then I gave the edge to the Clippers, but then Kawhi got hurt with an Achilles injury, which they haven't really specified what it is or what the severity is because the Clippers are always coy with their injuries. So that happened. I thought that the Clippers were done for because I thought a banged up Mitchell and a Conley would would do it. Uh, No, that's not the case. Clippers won two games without Kawhi and they were outstanding. Look, I don't like the Clippers. I make no secret of that being a Lakers fan. Didn't like the way they carried on last year. To their credit, this year they've just not been talking as much. They've gone about their business. And their role players have been outstanding. Like Reggie Jackson, he's got he's been given the nickname Big Government because he provides bailouts. It's one of my favorite basketball-related nicknames that I've, that I've seen in recent times. He, he went off in Game 6. He went for 27 points and 10 assists on 10 of 16 from the field. And how about Terrence Mann? He, he never scored, I think, more than 30 in college for his whole college career. And in the playoffs, he goes for 39 points on 7 of 10 from 3 and 15 of 21 from the field. Like, that is insane. Like, and when you add that to Marcus Morris having a huge game 6, sorry, game 5, and, you know, Paul George, no longer pandemic P, he's back to being playoff P. He's been, he's been awesome this series. Like, the Clippers role players around George stepped up and the Jazz didn't. And now we've got a, a series against a well-rested Phoenix, but Phoenix... Phoenix are uh, possibly without Chris Paul, so he's been ruled out for game one because he's in COVID protocols. We don't know if he has COVID or he's been exposed to someone with COVID, 
but it is worth noting that one out of 164 NBA players have tested positive. They haven't revealed who. If it's Chris Paul, he's probably out for the series. And so you've got a Clippers without Kawhi and a Suns without Chris Paul, which cha- really changes the series, I think, because... You know, full st- full strength, I'd actually give the edge to the Suns because Chris Paul has been unbelievable. Like, he he, he, sh- he shook off the shot, all the soreness that he was battling against the Lakers. He went for 26 points per game, five boards, 10 assists on 60... Sorry, I've got to read this because this is, this is insane, these splits. 62-75-100 are his shooting splits in the four-game series. So he didn't miss a free throw, hit 75% of his threes. 62% of his twos. So, yeah, if, he, if he's there, I think that the, the, the Suns are way too strong. They were the number two ranked defense in the playoffs, number six, I believe, for the regular season. Um, in the reg- Whereas the Clippers, number one offense in the playoffs, number three offense in the regular season. So it's a battle of offense versus defense. And the, a big reason why the Clippers ended up defeating the Jazz without Rudy Gobert. Sorry, not without Rudy Gobert. Jump the gun. Without Kawhi Leonard was because they were able to pick on Rudy Gobert. So Gobert's a defensive player of the year, but he can't guard the pick and roll on the switch. So the Clippers adjusted to what the the Jays were running out there. So credit to Ty Lue for amazing adjustments. He he went he went full small ball. He benched Ivica Ivica Zubac. Sorry, tough name to pronounce. He benched Zubac and just went completely small. Quinn Snyder didn't adjust. Part of it's because they don't have the roster to adjust, but hadn't even tried and adjust. So they kept putting Rudy Gobert in the pick and roll. Paul George was killing him. Reggie Jackson was killing him. They they murdered the they murdered the Jazz there. And the thing is, can they do the same thing to DeAndre Ayton? Can they play DeAndre Ayton off the floor for the Suns in the pick and roll? Now I don't think Ayton is quite as good a defender as Gobert in terms of a rim protector, but Ayton's way more mobile than Gobert. So I don't think Ayton gets killed. I don't think Aiton will get killed as much in the pick and roll as Gobert did. So I think the Suns have counters to that. I think the Suns can play small as well. Like if Marcus Morris goes um, center, what's to stop the Suns from playing Jay Crowder at center? I mean, it, it takes away a rim protector, but it's, it's going it's going small for small and Crowder's strong enough to guard Morris inside and, and like quick enough to guard him on the perimeter. Like they've actually, it's not ideal for the Suns to take Aiton off the floor, but if it's, show, if it's shown that he can't, guard like the pick and roll when he's forced to switch yep if it, like they've got monty williams has options and I, I think that mikhail bridges is probably the best like assuming that Kawhi is not going to be back in the series i don't think he will be i i think mikhail that frees up mikhail bridges to guard paul george i think he's one of the best perimeter defenders in the nba i think he was named all defense um one of the all defense teams he, he's he's unreal like i saw firsthand his defense against the lakers one of the best 3 and D players in the league. Um, I mean, Paul George is unguardable when he's on, but it's the closest thing you've got to a matchup. And on the flip side, I don't see anyone guarding Devin Booker. Like, I think Devin Booker's unguardable. I think if the if 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 DeAndre Ayton can defend the pick and roll, I think he's unguardable on the other end on offense. So if he's not played off the court for defensive purposes, I just I just think the Suns have. Too many, like they're too versatile. Like even Cameron Payne on the bench, off the bench, can kind of, well, sorry, Payne's probably going to be starting if Chris Paul's out. But Payne is one of the best bench point guards in the league, so I think he can match what Reggie Jackson can bring. So my guess is I'm going to go Suns in six. The way things stand, um, if Kawhi comes back and Chris Paul doesn't, I think that the Clippers win the series. And I think it kind of, I think it kind of remains Suns in six if they're both healthy, because I think that Kawhi and Chris Paul kind of have a similar impact on their team. So, yeah, Suns in six. I think that the Suns are going to win it all, to be honest, barring injury. They they really did impress me in their series against the Nuggets. They, I, I thought that the Suns had the stronger roster on paper, but I thought that with the Nuggets intangibles, the series would be a toss up. It was not a toss up. They they won by an average of 16 points a game in their four-game series sweep. Um, so, yeah, no, the Suns are way better than I give them credit for. I think they're better than any team in the East now that Brooklyn's out. So, yeah, I think the Suns are my pick now to win the championship. In the East, I, I, I honestly have no idea who's going to come out of it. Like, I think I think Milwaukee have the best chance because they're the healthiest team left. 
Uh, I think Philly match up pretty well with Milwaukee, but don't have anyone to. I mean, they'd have to put Ben on Ben Simmons on Giannis if if they wanted a chance to to slow him down. Atlanta Atlanta just don't have a match up for Giannis. They don't like. I know that Trey Young will absolutely torch Brook Lopez in the pick and roll, so it gives them a puncher's chance. But I, I think Giannis is more of a, match, a mismatch for the Hawks than he is for the Sixers. So, yeah, my pick, my pick is going to be a Suns Bucks final. But I, I guess we'll see. So when I'm on the show next week, whether that's actually going to be the case, or we'll have, we'll have a better idea of it. None of those series will be over this time next week, but. We'll have a better indication of whether I was right or wrong. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. This is the most the most parody I've seen in NBA playoffs in a long, long time. Because last year, the Lakers were quite heavily favoured. So yeah, most parody in a long time as a neutral. It's a joy to watch. All right, I think that wraps things up for today. I just wanted to say, make sure you tune into Sports Talk Line Network, not just for my show, but because there's lots of other great content. I mean, we've got NBA playoffs, but we've got... NHL playoffs in full swing. The MLB season is well underway. The Euros have started now. And the football season's actually coming up. It's going to be here a lot closer than we think. And also, if you like what you heard from me, please like the video, subscribe, comment, leave your thoughts, give us some feedback. Love to hear from you. Like, it's you guys are what make the channel what it is. Now, yeah, I'm. it's been interesting doing this by myself. So I get sick of the sound of my own voice, but... Yeah, I hope you've enjoyed the show anyway. I've been your host, Luca DeAngelis, and thank you for tuning in for this week's episode of Luca Talk Sports.